You may be seated. Let me invite you to turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2, and I'll start reading in verse 23 in just a minute. And I'm only going to read a few short verses today, verses 23 through 26. And um, before I do that, uh, let me remind you of something that you probably well know by now. One of the things that I think captures the mind and imagination of ministers training for the ministry or men training for the ministry especially in the Reformed Church, is the romanticism of it all. I think that oftentimes when you ask a young man what he longs for most, what he looks forward to most about the ministry, he'll tell you that it's the preaching of the Word. And I think there's a sense in which that's right. Of course, in chapter 4, Paul tells us of this very uh, epistle that we are to preach the Word in season and out of season, and that is... We are to preach the infallible and inerrant word of God in faithfulness in every opportunity that the Lord gives to us. And so we ought to be living, as it were, in chapter 4. And yet we also need to understand that the ministry is living in chapter 2 as well. And that means that we must minister, we must be shepherds to difficult people. We must not only proclaim the word with a pulpit standing between us, but we must minister to the minister the word face to face with people who are not always receptive to the word of God. And that takes us to the text that I want us to look at this morning. It's Second Timothy chapter two, but I want us to start reading in verse twenty three. I'll start reading in twenty two just to capture the paragraph, but then I'll read through the end of it. This is the inerrant and infallible word of the living God. Give your ear and attention to it. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. As I thought about this text, I thought to myself, one of the things that... uh, One of the things that is a a useful way of organizing it is one that came to me almost immediately when I looked at this text, and and that is a fishing theme. Uh, We are to be fishers of men, and this text gives us, I think, in some ways, a framework to think about being fishers of men in the pastoral ministry. I want to look at, first of all, uh, the fishing hole. I want us to look at the fisher man, and then I want us to look at the fish for which we are fishing. So let's first of all think about the fishing hole. I want us to use this uh, idea of the fishing hole loosely because you'll, you'll see why in just a minute, but I want you to think about it as I ask you the question, what is the fishing hole? What's the fishing hole that we're supposed to think about when we think about this text? And I, I think that it's... Um, right to propose that the fishing hole would be the kingdom of darkness. Now, what would characterize the kingdom of darkness as you read this text? Well, I think it's self-evident, foolishness, ignorance, uh, uneducated and ill-formed senseless controversies. Those are the things that would characterize controversies that come out of the kingdom of darkness. Now, no one likes controversy, and controversy is sometimes needed within the church. But the question that we have to ask is this. When we have a controversy that is epitomized as one coming out of the kingdom of darkness, what will be its marker? What will be the fruit that it produces? How will we know, as it were, that this particular controversy is one that arises out of this desperately dark fishing hole? And the answer to that is one that Paul gives pretty readily. 
he says that it is one that produces quarrels. A controversy that produces quarrels, like the one that we see in the text, is one that we want to avoid because it comes from the kingdom of darkness. Now, it's important to look up at verse 23 at this point, and of course we are to flee certain things, but what it is that I want you to notice is what we are to pursue. We are to pursue peace. But I want you to take a look at verse 23. 23 says that we're not necessarily to pursue a personal peace, although I think that's important, but what we are to pursue is peace along with those who call on the name of the Lord. In other words, we are to pursue a communal peace. In other words, what I want you to catch is this, and everybody's going to be quick to say, well, wait a minute, don't we want to pursue truth? And if truth means quarrel, then we sometimes have to, and that's, that's another conversation. What I want you to understand is this, quarrelsomeness is not a virtue. Quarrelsome, being quarrelsome is not a particular mark of the gospel minister. In fact, if you look at 1 Peter chapter 3, it says that the minister is not to be a pugilist. He's not to be a contender, a striker. He's not to be one who loves and engages in quarrels. Now, we need to understand this. There is a difference between having nothing to do with foolish controversies that engage in quarrels and trying to retrieve those who have engaged themselves in such practices. Let me put it this way. The minister is not to swim in this fishing hole, but he is to fish out of it. Now, I, I want to just be candid with you because I, I want you to hear me uh, when I say this to you. Many of you, because of the internet, will feel that you're called to a wider and broader range of ministry. You'll feel that the world is your calling and you're lying to yourself. If you are called to a group of 30 people, 60 people, that's your sphere of ministry. And if you're faithful to those 30 or 60, if you're faithful to those 10, then that's the ministry to which you are engaged, as long as you are called to it. But you see, the lure, the lure is strong today to be a blogger. The lure is strong today to be an internet personality. And I want to tell you something. The thing that you need to say to yourself every time you're tempted to engage in a Twitter quarrel or a Facebook engagement or some kind of thing, every time that you're, every time that you're feeling tempted to engage in it, put the phone down and say, to whom am I to minister today? And then put a name to that. And then get up and engage in that ministry. And I want to tell you something, it will produce more fruit for the kingdom of God than giving a, a quick social media blast or some sort of blog. It will. So the minister is to not engage in quarrelsome controversies, but he is to help pull those out of it. Now, that means we have to say something about the fisherman. The fisherman is the Lord's servant. Now that should catch your eye as soon as you see it. Notice this. The servant of the Lord is, is, the, is the title that's given to the servant of the Lord in those suffering servant passages in Isaiah. In other words, what Paul is doing is he is lifting that idea of the suffering servant out and he is placing it down here because he wants us to see that there's an absolutely strong connection between those who are to be like the suffering servant in their ministry and those who are to replicate his ministry in a hard context called the local church. You see, Paul has obviously studied the suffering servant, and he wants us to do the same. Let me, let me show you something in Matthew's gospel. It's, a, it's just a small thing, but it's in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 18. Here we find that Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there and, 
And uh, he did these things in order to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. And then Matthew quotes under the inspiration of the Spirit, Isaiah 42, 1 through 3. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved, and so on. But look now in verse 19. This is of the suffering servant. He will not quarrel or cry aloud. Now, the next thing that you need to do is look down at verse 24 in 2 Timothy chapter 2. And it says that the suffering servant, the servant of the Lord, is not to be quarrelsome. He must stay out of the pond that breeds so much quarreling. He must not breed more quarreling. He is to fish out of it. Now, how is this ever going to happen? He is to keep a basic posture. He is to be kind to everyone. He is to be kind to everyone, says the text. Now, I want you to think about that for just a minute. This is a hard thing today, especially, especially in our cultural context, especially in our Christian cultural context. Why? Because we have such an emphasis on masculinity today. Now, listen, I'm all for being masculine. I happen to be a man myself and quite enjoy it. But I don't need to continue to trumpet around that I'm a man in order to be a man. In fact, I think that if you have to trumpet around that you're a man, you're probably not very confident in the man that you are. So I'm all for masculinity. However, I say that, but I say that as one who every once in a while gets snagged. And I was on the way out to the Banner Truth Conference in 2018, and I was talking to some guys in the car as we were driving out, and I was telling them, I said, you got to be careful because the ministry, can, the ministry can take away your masculinity. And we got there, and Alistair Begg was preaching, and he opened up, and he said this. Now listen to this. In a church that is increasingly feminized, there is a particular need for men, but for these men to be gentle men. For these men to be Christ-shaped men. And you know, you ever have that sense where you, know, where you, where you just say to the Lord, okay, I get it. That, that in your providence was directed right at me. And then I went back and I said to the men that I drove out there with, I said, I don't know if you men, I don't know if I came to your mind when Alistair said what he said, but I came to my mind. And, uh, and the one guy looked at me and he said, you came to mind. And I said, and I'm sorry. <laughs> but I'm not the only one who starts with this. There's a commentary, and this is a more scholarly commentary. Listen to what it says about this text. It says, after this, after this idea about being kind and gentle, listen. But one should not strain these words and make a soft jellyfish out of the Lord's slave. I thought, ah. Now, this isn't a new commentary. I thought, here's a man who's struggling with the same thing that I'm struggling with. But I'll tell you where that fear grows out of. That fear grows out of the fact that too often the church has allowed the world to define its terms. And instead of allowing the church to be defined in its understanding of gentleness by the person of Jesus Christ, we've allowed the world to identify that and describe and define that term. And shame on us for doing that. You know what gentleness is? Gentleness is strength under control. You know, you know what I'm saying? I'm saying, you know, it's like when you're wrestling around with your son and you could snap him in pieces if you, if you just, you know, exercised in a, the, your strength at that moment. But instead, you let him pin you and you kind of toss him around about. That's gentleness under control. That's strength. But it's shrouded in gentleness. But then there's this idea of not only do we need to be gentle, but we need to be apt to teach, not not quarrelsome, which escalates, but able to teach, which explains. It's the qualification of an elder, brothers. I want to tell you this. I recognize this, and I want to be realistic. It's easy for me to say this, but I'll tell you what. It's one thing to take a gun to the range and load the gun up at the range, but it's another thing to load your gun up while somebody else is shooting at you, isn't it? And so you need to be able to teach without anger. And so this is followed by patiently enduring evil. Isn't that interesting? Kind and gentle and all of these things. But Paul's real, isn't he? 
patiently enduring evil. One commentator put it this way. He says, he says putting up with what is bad in the, in the one needing to be taught. And then he goes on to say a couple lines later, for not a few will at first act badly enough. And indeed they will. This is needed. This disposition to be patient is needed if he is to correct his opponents with gentleness. And this is the Lord's servant. And I want you to know something. There's no glory in it. There's no glory in that. There's a lot of humility in that, a lot of humbling in that. But there's no glory in it. Now let's talk for a minute about the fish. A couple of things here I want you to notice. Notice that it says God may grant God may give them repentance. That is, in the midst of this ministry, we need to remember that it's God who is the one who grants repentance. Now, what is repentance? You know it's a saving grace wrought in the heart by God's spirit. It's not from us. In other words, we, there's a sense in, in which the treatment we receive is humiliating, but that which we are receiving it for is humiliating because we're not going to produce anything in them by our work. God is going to give them repentance and he may choose to give them repentance using us as instruments and he may not. But I want you to catch this. God uses servants. He uses servants. Ministers ought to see themselves as such, as as useful instruments who may be used in the way that they would love to be used and who may not be used in the way that they might like to be used. But I want to tell you this, that if you're the kind of minister who says, you know what, I'm a minister and I demand respect, I want to tell you something, you're not a very useful tool already. But if you're the kind of minister who is willing to bear the reproach of Christ, if you're the kind of minister who is willing to engage and participate in the humiliation of Christ, then I want you to know something. You're, you're, a, you're a minister who will be a very useful servant in the hands of the Lord. Why? Because this, this leads, this could well lead a person into truth. But the ne next part of this is a help. And I think it gives us insight. I think it helps us to be ministers of gentleness. Why? Because we need to understand where they're coming from. They're in the devil's snare. They've been captured and they're doing his will. And I think this is very frightening. And I think it's very sobering. And I think it's very compassion producing. You know, everybody, you know, you can look at this person and, and this person, for whatever reason, will believe that they are absolutely right and the imprimatur of God is upon their words and upon their arguments, every syllogism, every word of every syllogism, but they're ensnared. And if we look at their pride, then we're going we're gonna to rise to it in one way. But if we look at them with compassion, that these people are ensnared, we're going to treat them in a totally different way. The text reminds us the way that we need to look at them. I want you to know something. I want you to know that when you begin to stumble and have difficulty over this, you need to remember that when you turn back to the suffering servant passages, we were, we were, we're there reminded that the servant was beaten and he was scoffed at and he was ridiculed and his hair was pulled and his beard pulled out. And this suffering servant went so far as to die for those who belonged to him. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is, how much are we willing to love our congregation in the likeness of Christ when one of our people happens to fall into this kind of a hole? That's the kind of question that we need to ask ourselves. We need to not be quarrelsome, but kind, patiently enduring evil, and we need to be gentle. And I want you to know something. All of this will not set forth the minister in all of his glory, but it will set forth Christ in all of his glory. And I think the question that you need to ask, the question that you need to answer right now is whose glory are you really after? 
Because if you get out there in the ministry and you start taking everything personally and you start rising to the occasion of quarrels and you start acting like a quarrelsome person in the face of those who would quarrel with you, you have your answer. You would seek your own glory. But if you're willing to bear the humiliation of Christ, if you're willing to if you're willing to embrace and embody what Paul says in this text, then, then the glory that you're willing for is the glory of Christ. And may that be every desire in this place, that you would desire the glory of Christ. Father in heaven, thank you for this day and for this reminder of, of what it means to be a minister of the gospel. Please, Lord, uh, bless these students with not only the teaching, but also the great desire to embody uh, this teaching. And Father, we pray that in so doing, as you send them out into fields ripe for harvest, that you would give them a, a fruitful ministry. Father, we pray that you would uh, give them their heart's desire, even many who follow Christ. And we pray that as they come, that these men would be able to minister to those who need the gospel daily. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's uh, stand and sing 131A.